Okay, so good morning, everyone, and welcome to the last day of this year's TRP program. And I would like to start with thanking all organizers for this uh, semester and this great event. So without further ado, I want to introduce Egehan Turan. So Egehan is a senior student in Boazic University. He studies math and physics. And together with Egehan, uh, we, had, uh, we had a great semester. We studied geometric invariant theory, and he will today present uh, one of the hidden gems in geometric invariant theory, which is the Kempfner's theorem. So the floor is yours again. Hi everyone, I'm Ege from Bones University, as my mentor mentioned, and I will be presenting the Kempfner's theorem today. But before moving on to my presentation, I would like to thank Mahmoud Levantron for spending so much time on this project. Okay. So here I have four seemingly unrelated areas. One of them is classical mechanics, and I'm sure all of you know what this is. The optimization theory is the theory uh, that deals with how to optimize stuff and how to do it efficiently. And I have complexity theory, which deals with uh, how fast algorithms work and how to make them faster, or even can you make them faster. And linear programming is a sort of programming. And this four seemingly unrelated areas employ one thing in common, and that is the Kepner's theorem, which I will be presenting today. Okay, but before moving on to the theorem itself, I want to set some definitions so that we make sure we are on the same page. My first definition is, is an algebraic group. An algebraic group is a group that is also an algebraic variety. And al varieties are the things that you deal with when you're studying uh, ge algebraic geometry. And you can think them as zero locus of some sort of polynomial, some set of polynomials. OK. The other group is a Lie group. And that is a group that is also a differentiable manifold. So on Lie groups, I can talk about derivatives and differentiable forms and things like that. And in this presentation, I will be dealing with two different topologies. The first one is a standard topology that is coming from the Euclidean metric on CN or RN. And the other topology is the Zarensky topology, which comes from the uh, this algebraic variety structure of things. And when I when I write S closed or Z closed, that just means it is closed in the standard topology and, or it's closed in the Zarensky topology. And main example for both of them, algebraic group and the Lie group, is an S closed group of general linear groups of complex numbers, for example. And the general linear group is just a group of n by n matrices whose determinant is non-zero. And with Lie groups, I can talk about something called a Lie algebra associated with a Lie group, and that is just the tangent space at the identity. Of course, by, by just this, it is a vector space, and I have to give you a bilinear product in order to make it into an algebra, and this bilinear product actually comes from the Lie group structure itself. And my really important definition here is the symmetric subgroup of the general linear group. And it is defined as a Zarensky closed subgroup of GLNC, such that if a matrix G is in this group, then its Hermitian conjugate must also be in this group too. But of course, if I'm talking about Hermitian conjugacy, I, I should give you an inner product. And if I'm not specifying my inner product, I, I'm just using the standard inner product on CN. And I have two examples here. The first one is the special linear group, and the second one is the orthonormal group. And I also have a, a non-example here, which is the unitary group. And this group is will be super important for this talk, but this is not a symmetric subgroup. Why? Because here you see a equation, and it seems like it must satisfy the symmetricity condition. And indeed, actually, this satisfies the symmetricity condition, but it is not Zarinsky. So it is not closed in the Zarinsky topology, which is really important. So we should not skip on this Zarinsky closed uh, structure of this symmetric subgroups. OK, now uh, I will give you my first theorem without groups. And this theorem states that take any symmetric subgroup G and look at the uh, unitary matrices inside of this group. And, and let's call this K. Then the theorem states that it is Lie algebra of G is just equal to Lie algebra of K plus I times the Lie algebra of K. And moreover, I have this homeomorphism between this space and G. And this is actually just the uh, generalization of polar decomposition in complex numbers. I I'm sure all of you know, you can represent a complex number by length times a phase. And this is actually just the generalization of that. 
for n equal to one, this will just reduce to that case. And if I have time after my presentation, I can just show you how that is done. Okay. And why am I dealing with algebraic groups and what they are good for? So algebraic groups can act on algebraic varieties in a sort of like a regular way so that their properties are really easy to study. Uh, and let's say G is my algebraic group and X is my algebraic variety. Then I can just uh, show this definition. Oh, sorry, show this action by g times x or just g x, and the set of capital G x will be called the orbit of x. So they are basically the elements of x that I can go from x to by acting with g. And as an example, take any symmetric subgroup g under G L and f, where f is just a field, and let your x be f n. And GX can just be the matrix action. Okay. <coughs> so I have some corollaries here. By the polar decomposition theorem I just showed, we know that G is the Zarinsky closure of K. And this is really important because this makes K a maximal compact subgroup. And maximal compact subgroups are really nice because we know a lot of properties of those maximal compact subgroups. So I can just use them here too. And moreover, since G is the Zarinsky closure of K, we can push a structure on K to G. For example, if K is acting on X, then I can just push this action to G and make G act on X. So, and also, for example, since K is a compact group, I think somebody yesterday mentioned harm measure. Using the harm measure, I can uh, show that there is a K invariant or mission inner product. And this inner product indeed, uh, satisfy orthonormality condition for G. For example, if I have a subspace that is G stable, then its orthonormal component with respect to this, in this inner product will also be G stable. So these structures are really nice. One last thing before I mention the Kempness theorem is the Kempness function. This is, a fun this is the function here. And this goes from G to X, uh, G to real numbers, I'm sorry. And it is just defined as this. And we will be concerned with the minimum values of this function on an orbit. So let's say GV is my orbit. And since this is a norm squared, I'm basically trying to find the uh, vector that is closest to the origin. And as I will show later on, the first derivative of this function at the identity is given by 2 times this inner product. Therefore, this gives me a motivation to define a new thing. And it, which is the critical vectors. And it is just defined as a, a vector is called critical if and only if this, in, this equality uh, is satisfied for all x in Lie algebra of G. So such a vector will be a, a critical point of this function because it will make the first derivative go to zero. Okay. Now I'm ready to talk about the Kempness theorem itself. Let G and K be, as mentioned earlier, which means G is a symmetric subgroup and K is the unitary uh, element inside of it. And let uh, V be a vector in CN. Then the first statement of the Kempness theorem states that K is critical if and only if the norm of V is a global minimum on its orbit. So I'm looking at an orbit and I'm trying to find the minimum elements. Those elements will actually come from this, uh, the elements that satisfy this property. And this is really important. Why? Because if I'm, for example, trying to minimize a function in optimization theory, instead of calculating the function itself at every point, I can just look at this, look at the vectors which satisfy this condition. So that is actually really nice. Uh, the second statement states that the critical points on a G orbit actually form a K orbit. So for example, if, I'm, if I want to find every vector that minimizes my norm, in order to do that, I can just find one and look at this k orbit. So I don't really need to look at every single element of the orbit. If I can find one critical element, that will be enough. Uh, the third statement states that if the orbit of v is closed, I'm sorry, orbit of v is closed if and only if there is exists a critical element, there exists a critical element on this orbit. OK, let's move on to the proof of the theorem. By polar decomposition theorem, I know that I can write G as the following, K times exponential I Li K. And this I Li K actually resides on the Li J. 
Lie algebra of G. So I can just look at the Lie algebra of G. And, it, and the complex function is just GV norm squared, right? And I can write any G in this fashion because G can be decomposed like this. So I'm writing it the G like this. And since my inner product is K invariant, I can just drop to K and left with this. Then I will call the function on the right, alpha t, and look at its derivatives. The first derivative at zero will just give you this, as I mentioned earlier. This is the first derivative at the identity. And since v is critical, that this will be just equal to zero. And the second derivative is four times the norm squared, which is always non-negative because norms are non-negative. Therefore, for by basic calculus knowledge, we know that t0 is actually a minimum for alpha. So write g as k times exponential x, then look at the norm squared of g, which is just this, which is equal to that. Since my inner product is k invariant, I can just drop the k and left with this. And this is the value of alpha at t is equal to 1. And this is the value of alpha at t is equal to 0. And I know that t is equal to 0 is a minimum, so that this inequality must be satisfied. So indeed, norm of v is a global minimum, because anything other than v is just greater or equal to that. OK, this is the one way of the can only. Uh, the other way is even easier. If the norm of v is a minimum, this function must be must give me 0 at the identity, right? Because it's the critical point. And the uh, value of its derivative at 0 is just equal to this. And this must be equal to 0, so v is indeed critical. OK. The second statement of the theorem states that critical points on a G orbit form a K orbit. And by one, I know that critical elements have minimum norm. So let's say that W and V both be both critical. Then their norms must be equal, right? Because if one of them is greater than the other one, the other one wouldn't be a critical. Okay. And since I know that V, I'm sorry, W is in the K orbit of V, I can just write W as this by the polar decomposition theorem. And let's assume for a second that x times v is non-zero. Then the second derivative, which I just found here, will be strictly greater than zero, because if xv is non-zero, by acting something with exponential, I cannot make it zero. So the second derivative will be strictly greater than the zero, which makes alpha 1 strictly greater than alpha 0. But alpha 1 is just equal to norm of v squared, and alpha 0 is just normal, norm of the v itself. And by my first assumption, this contradicts with that. And so that I know x times v must be equal to 0. Then the exponential x times v, by just Taylor expanding this exponential, I can see that this is just equal to v. So w, which was equal to that, is just equal to this. So indeed, w, w uh, resides on a k orbit of v, because it is just k times v, where k comes from the uh, the capital K I just talked about. OK, now I will prove the last statement, one way of the last statement, which I am going to prove if GV is closed, then there exists a critical element on this orbit. OK, let's say that GV is closed. And let infimum of this complex function be M. Then since GV is closed, I have to, oh, the, the, the infimum must be obtained at some point. I think so. W must be obtained at some point, and that point will be a critical point because by one, I just showed the global minimum in, in this orbit will be a critical element. And since W obtains the infimum value, W is strictly smaller than any other thing. So indeed, there exists a critical element. So now I did one, two, and half of three in order to do the other way of the tree, which states there exists a critical element in GV. If there exists a critical element in GV, then GV is closed. OK, in order to prove that, I have to give you some more facts. And this is the uh, interesting part of the proof. So first of all, there is a fact in geometric invariant theory which states that every orbit closure contains a unique closed orbit. So it makes sense to talk about the unique closed orbit in an orbit closure. OK. Let V be a vector in V and GW be a closed orbit in the orbit closure of GV. Then there exists an element of V algebra of G such that it is permission or self adjoint. And this limit here goes inside the closed orbit. Okay. 
Now I'm ready to prove the last part of my statement, the Kempner's theorem. First of all, let V be critical and Y be the closed orbit and its orbit closure. Then I know since since X is our mission, I know that I can find an eigen orthonormal eigenbasis of this X and let the associated eigenvalues be lambda i. Then I can decompose v into this uh, basis and further decompose v into these three parts, v plus, v minus, and v zero. v plus is the parts that are coming from positive eigenvalues in this decomposition. v minus, are, v minus is the part that is coming from negative eigenvalues of this decomposition, and v zero is the part that is coming from the zero eigenvalue of this uh, decomposition. The second step, I will show you that if V plus is non-zero, V plus is non-zero if and only if V minus is non-zero. Okay, I know that V is critical, so that this inner product must be equal to zero. And this inner product in this decomposition is just equal to this. So I have a summation here. And also, uh, since X is Hermitian, I know that its eigenvalues are real. So the terms here will be either positive or ne negative or zero. And if I have a positive term, I need to have a negative term in order to make the sum go to zero, right? Then, then if V plus is non-zero, then V minus must be non-zero and vice versa, because I, if I have a negative term, I need a positive term. Okay. And there is only one thing that I didn't use yet, and it is the limit in the uh, hilbert mumford theorem. And using that limit, let's say this limit goes to Y in the closed order. I will just look at the norm of y, and this will be just equal to this sum here. But here, as you can see, I have a term like e to 2 lambda i t, and I'm taking t to minus infinity. So if I have, an, if I have a term that is coming from a negative eigenvalue, this, this summation will just blow up. So this cannot happen, because e to the 2 lambda i t, if lambda i is negative, t goes to minus infinity, will just go to e to infinity, which is blow up. So V minus must be zero because I don't want this to blow up. But this forces V plus to be zero by the step two that I just showed. If V plus, v plus is non-zero, if and only if V minus is non-zero. So V is indeed just equal to V zero. Then I will just look at X times V, which is just equal to X times V zero, which is just equal to zero because V zero is the part that's coming from the zero eigenvalue of X. So it will be just equal to zero. And this exponential term times V will be just equal to V by Taylor extending. And this limit, which does not depend on T because this is just equal to V, will be just V as T goes to minus infinity. It is always V. So this shows me that V indeed resides on this closed orbit. But V only has one orbit. And this shows that this orbit is closed. So indeed, my orbit in orbit of V is closed. And these are my references. This is the uh, book that we read throughout the summer. And if you have sort of have a background in algebraic geometry, I think that's a good point to start the geometric invariant theory. And this is the original paper written by Kemp and Ness. This is actually a really easy paper to read. It's just like a 10 pages. And the way they prove it is actually really interesting. They prove this for tori first, where, where, where G is tori and then use something called Cartan decomposition to generalize to that. But here, it seems like I didn't use toruses or things like that, but indeed, actually, uh, the, the proof of the hilbert mumford theorem actually does the same. He first proves this for a tori, then generalizes that, that to, to every uh, G using uh, the Cartan decomposition. So I, I indeed hide this detail under this theorem. So, okay. And that's about it. If you have any questions. <laughs>